obviously, uh, diplomacy in the pub isn't actually in the pub, though you can hear them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm Phil Archer. For those of you I haven't met, I'm an associate professor of international relations here at UOW. I'm also the discipline leader for politics and international studies. And with uh, Susan Engel, we co direct the UOW Future of Rights Center. So you can click the pencil if you're interested in following it. Um, now, obviously, I'm talking about a fairly weighty subject because this is a diplomacy in the pub talk. I'm deliberately not making it as weighty as it could be. Um, but a couple things about what I'm not going to talk about, and I am going to talk a little bit about some of the atrocities that occurred, but I'm not going to go too in depth there. I will warn you there's one image I include that I'll warn you about. Um, I'm also not going to talk about any of the nuclear issues, um, but as you're probably aware, we are doing a joint series. And the first week of June on Wednesday night, I will be screening Dr. Strangelove and talk about nuclear issues. Have you guys seen Strangelove before? Yes. Consider, it's literally considered the second best satire ever made. So. What's the third? I'm not sure. <laughs> but I know it's the second. Um, but let me get started. And I'm not sure, you, you guys have probably been following it, right? You've been, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I sort of left it a bit open-ended. I included some details around the invasion itself uh, before moving into the humanitarian situation um, and the atrocities they committed. But basically, so when Russia initially launched its invasion, it went really big. It decided it was going to attack Ukraine on four different axes. So down here in the south from Crimea, that is listed at Occupy back in 2014. Then from the DPR and the LPR, the two autonomous people's republics that had basically been fighting in Ukraine since 2014. Then up here around Kharkiv, Kar Kharkiv rather, and then of course approaching Kiev, uh, doing a big swing to attempt to circle. And they planned a quick campaign. We know there's evidence that they actually had their brain uniforms on their vehicles. They were thinking the Ukrainian defense was just going to fall apart very quickly. And they planned an airborne attack to seize Kiev, which failed. Uh, among other things, of course, uh, Ukraine had been able to shoot down one of the major military transport aircraft, uh, which we now know was through US intelligence. So that basically starts. And they, their whole battle plan falls apart very quickly because it turns out uh, the Ukrainian forces are actually pretty well trained and put out really fierce resistance. Um, the critical moment here, I think, though, was those first few days when they could have actually won. And it was pure resistance on the part of the Ukrainian forces, as well as, of course, the president very strongly staying, holding his ground, where we got uh, some intelligence suggesting in Russia that the suit was just going to flee, like we'd seen Gaddy flee Afghanistan. And basically, he provided the moral support they needed, they held, and then, of course, they started getting armed shipments from the West starting with anti-tank weapons. And bear in mind, Russia has a lot of tanks. They've got huge numbers in storage from the Soviet Union. Estimates, they may have up to 10,000. NATO had always planned to fight a bunch of Russian tanks or Soviet tanks. They've been developing anti-tank weapons for decades because of that. And so when the Russian invasion starts, and you see these announcements, Oh, yes, the U.S. is giving them javelins. U.K. is giving them end laws. Basically, what you're seeing is cutting down state-of-the-art weapons being given to Ukrainians for free, and they're being given thousands of them, which no one really expected to happen. No one really expected NATO and other countries to reinforce Ukraine as quickly as they have. And we've seen that that's progressively gone up. You may have seen news reports. There was talk of even giving them old MiGs, which never really eventuated. But we now have the U.S. giving them state-of-the-art uh, artillery pieces that they're training Ukrainian troops on. They've given them at least 70 of those, as well as, can you remember the number? I believe it's 140,000 shells just for those artillery pieces. So we're seeing huge arm shipments going in. So basically, what we saw in the first stages of the war was that they were able to grab a fair amount of territory, primarily because the Ukrainian military wasn't fighting itself. They were defending Kiev. And it worked. They successfully blocked the Russians' attacks up here in exchange for trading territory down here, where we basically see the Russian authorities be able to create a land bridge in effect between the DPR and the LPR and Crimea, except for the city of Marble, which of course has been under siege since the attack started. 
want to grab a chair and come up to the big table, or <laughs> don't don't worry about sitting in the back. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and of course, Mark will still holding out now now down to basically the remnants of the steel mill. Um, but basically, because of this resistance, what we saw is everything fell apart. And it wasn't just because of Ukraine's efforts. It's also because the Russian attack, quite frankly, was a clusterfuck. They screwed up on so many different dimensions. You literally had military strategists going up on Twitter going like, hey, they're like using 1970s tactics. Oh, we, we don't need air superiority. What's that? Like, you know, this is stuff even in World War II where they wouldn't have done this. Allowing Ukraine to keep uh, planes and particularly drones in the air. Their logistics was a complete mess. Of course, we had the lovely, huge, 100 kilometer long Russian military convoy that basically got stuck. Why did it get stuck? Well, because the Ukrainians just kicked off the head and the tail of the convoy, and then the, the vehicles couldn't go anywhere. One guy actually did research and found part of the issue. They have really old tires. So, of course, these vehicles are designed to go off-road. Stuff, they're military vehicles. Except with really old tires, you can't properly deflate them to go off-road. If you do deflate them, they tend to blow up on you. And so you had all these vehicles that were getting abandoned because their tires blew on them, because they hadn't been properly maintained. And this is still an issue. He had tweets this past week where he was showing pictures of similarly blown tires and going, look at this marking made in the USSR. So it was in English, it was made for export, but it was clearly made at least 30 years ago. Do you want 30 year old tires on your vehicle? Probably not. So the logistics sucked, but even the force they were deploying were weird. Like I, I have this tank image, so obviously that's not what you want to happen to your tank. Um, that's a Russian T-72. T-72 is one of the most sold tanks throughout the world. It's a T-72B. It was probably made in between 1986 and 1989. So once again, this is a Soviet era tank. And they were using it in their main forces. And once again, we saw comments on Twitter where now analysts were going like, these vehicles are so old, they shouldn't be there. We were seeing some T-80s, which are newer tanks, T-90s, which are the newest tank they have in the field, but a lot of this really old hardware. And people just couldn't figure out why it was going on. And then, of course, we had the average Ukrainian's response to the invasion. And a few images here, of course, the uh, old lady who confronted the Russian soldier with comments that you should put these sunflower seeds in your pockets so that they will grow in Ukrainian land after you die. Um, the famous uh, Russian warship, go fuck yourself, uh, which is now a Madrid stamp. Um, the Ukrainian tractor army uh, and their massive buildings. I, I couldn't find it, but there was a meme at one point where it was uh, largest tank forces in the world. It's like uh, China, the US, Russia, those Ukrainian farmers, and then various other states. And even the uh, road authorities getting involved here with uh, Ukraine suggesting that residents take down street signs and the state roading agency actually printing up new signs that all read variations of go fuck yourself. Um, so this very strong opposition and strong consorted opposition. And this is one of the things. Ukrainian society had been pretty fractured. We had seen divisions. We had seen a lot of pro-Russian views. This has been clear in their elections. This has been clear in their politics for years, if not decades. And Russia assumed that would cause them to pull apart, and instead it unifies them. Um, then we move to the invasion phase two, what basically the end of March, where Russia just abandons its efforts in the north. They pull out and retreat, in part based on contrast from Ukrainian forces around here. And then they focus everything around the south, particularly, of course, continuous theater of Marple, but also pushing this way from the outdoor and here. Now, the interesting thing here is you also had a lot of something that's okay, this is they're now going to win the war. We're going to see a huge amount of Russian equipment move down, and we're going to see a massive amount of their military pushing. And the Ukrainians are strong here. This is their most fortified area, because of course this is where they've been fighting the war since 2014. It's their most elite units are there. So it's assumed that it's going to be slaughtered, but people assume that we see Russia gradually gain territory. And the interesting thing is we actually haven't seen that much. What we've been seeing, month is basically this, that 
What the Russians do is massive coordinated artillery barrages. So just boom, level everything. Ukrainian forces retreat. The Russians move forward, occupy the land. The Ukrainians counterattack and push them back. And so what we've seen is they're literally trading the Ukrainian for pillage. Um, there's been some Ukrainian successful counterattacks in the north. And this is a, just a diagram of the current forces. This is a, 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 as of 30th of April. So this is the Russian uh, battalion tactical groups. So they're theoretically about 800 to 1,000 soldiers a person. These are uh, Ukrainian brigade forces. Now those, don't let the numbers fool you. You're looking at that going, 13 versus 3. How on earth are they still holding it? Uh, the brigade units are about double the size of the contingents. So the Ukrainian formations are about double the size of the average Russian formation. But nonetheless, Russia theoretically has a lot of force that's pushing against it and it's still not working. So why is this? What's going on here? What's the Russian high command up to? Well, this is a recent image, possibly problematic. Um, but in all seriousness, their losses have been immense. We don't know precisely how much they lost, um, but this is the UK's uh, defense intelligence update, where they basically estimated that Russia had committed about 65% of its total ground combat strength to its invasion. So they sent in 120 battalion tactical groups. And this is the UK saying that at least a quarter of these units are probably now combat ineffective. So literally they're gone. They no longer exist. And what we see particularly among elite units such as the airborne forces is they had the highest level of attrition because they were the forces that Russia used to make sure. They're also the forces that have the most complex training, and so they're the forces that it's harder to really reconstitute them. Um, now this is Ukrainian armed forces information from the Ukrainian independent, obviously because it's from Ukraine, you, you do need to take it with a grain of salt, but we've got other uh, open source intelligence information that th this does appear to be at least close proximity. That Russia may have lost 24,000 troops. So just to put this in perspective, since the end of February, the Russian military has lost more troops than the Soviet Union admitted to losing in Afghanistan over a decade. Like this is just combat fatalities that we have not seen for literally decades in a standard nation state conflict. They've also lost, as you can see, a lot of tanks, a lot of armored personnel vehicles, a lot of artillery pieces, and so on and so on. And of course, with a lot of this, particularly in the early stages, it wasn't just that they were actually being destroyed, it's that they were being abandoned. And Ukraine was grabbing them Remember, this is all the same equipment as Ukraine has because they were both Soviet states. And so Ukraine doesn't, your average Ukrainian soldier doesn't know how an M1 Abrams works, but they do know how a T-72 works. And so there were estimates that at various points in this conflict that Ukraine may actually have more tanks right now than they did at the start of the con of conflict. Another thing we're just not used to seeing, the idea that, oh, well, we have more stuff than we've had. So shifting from the military perspective to a bit more on the humanitarian situation. And this has obviously been where this war has had a huge effect. Because what we've seen is the massive displacement of the Ukrainian population. So we've seen massive movements just within cities. You've probably all seen the images of people sheltering in the subway system and community level centers in New York City. Now sheltering in their basements for protection. But similarly, fleeing from the areas where the fighting is the worst in other parts of the so a lot of the fighting fled out of the community when it looked like it was going to be surrounded, um, but also fleeing outside of the community. So we've already seen, since the end of February, about 5.3 million people become refugees, and about 7.7 .7 million people are internally displaced within Ukraine. Now, those numbers, just to put them in perspective, those are basically the numbers we saw come out of Syria during the height of its civil war, but it took that conflict about two to three years to reach that point. This has all happened in a couple of months. And we're seeing really heartbreaking stories. This is one uh, tweet that I retweeted where this woman who had done a book with Paul Lakaba literally had to carry her 18 month, year, uh, 18 month daughter, year and a half, 18 month old daughter, 20 kilometers on foot to get out of the combat zones. And this is also going to have an immense cost to the international community. So the UN has asked for 2.25 billion to support humanitarian assistance within Ukraine. And 
and they're also asking for future money outside. Now, one of the most plausible things that has come up with this conflict is that the neighboring countries around Ukraine have actually opened their borders. They've accepted in huge numbers of refugees, including Poland, which is now on, on the current data of um, the 2nd of May, taken out over 3 million Ukrainian refugees. Um, if you're wondering what Australia has done, well, we've granted 6,000 visas. Um, but don't worry, those aren't new visas. Those are out of our standard humanitarian development. So they're not actually new refugee places. Uh, what that means is just Ukrainians are taking spaces that other refugees could have bought and come to Australia on. Um, we have also allowed Ukrainians in Australia who are on other visas to get a special humanitarian concern visa. So that means that they don't have to worry about their visa status right now, but that is temporary. So the government could choose to uh, revoke those visas at some point in the future. Um, but generally we've seen very positive status. So example, this is a flyer that uh, Slovakia was doing, and as you can see it's both in English and Ukrainian. Um, and it just says, yeah, we're, hey, we'll take care of you. And literally people were being handed these flyers as they crossed the border. You know, yep, go, go check, check out this code, you'll get accommodation, you'll get food, you'll get work opportunities, you'll get health care, you'll get hygiene packages. And there were so many pictures of people being generous around us. Uh, so the main uh, train station in Poland, as trains were arriving from Ukraine, um, one set of people realized, of course, that um, parents who had small children were having to leave their strollers behind because they couldn't get on trains. And so people were just leaving their strollers at the train station to take it to ground. And we've seen all of these moments, these uh, touching moments, responding to these refugee flows. Um, and obviously, this also costs an immense amount of money. Yeah? Um, just so I want an elaboration, I've noticed the third biggest uh, refugee influx has been to the Russian Federation. I will be talking about that. Excellent. Refugees, yes. Yeah, no, th there's a lot of problems with it. Um, because this is the HR figures, of course, they trip them up without any comment. But yes, we will be talking about that number in a second. Um, and that actually transitions me to the third and final part that I did want to talk about is uh, the Russian process. Um, because, you know, th this conflict begins and people are wondering how big is it going to be. And one of the things is we immediately see that Russia begins engaging very quickly in indiscriminate attacks against civilians and against civilian targets, clear civilian targets, uh, including one of the first buildings to get hit, uh, where they're just firing, these are cruise missiles, they should be fairly accurate. If you're hitting buildings like that with them, generally it means that you're not carrying where you're aiming, or you are aiming at that building, both of which uh, violate the Geneva Conventions. Then we see the first possible attack, uh, where a veterinary children's hospital in Mariupol uh, was attacked, uh, women literally in labor had to be evacuated. Um, and this is one of the first uh, examples, too, where we see efforts of Russian disinformation that just failed really badly. Uh, because literally, we saw tweets about this, we saw some of the victims who had to be evacuated out of that hospital, um, including uh, this woman, Mariana. Um, and Russia basically said, oh, she's a crisis actor. Look, she has an Instagram account. She gives beauty tips. She's not a real victim here. And everyone sort of went, wait, 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 she's pregnant in her Instagram shots. Like, this is not some big surprise. Um, and, but this is their efforts. They're trying to do this, trying to claim basically that this person is clearly a crisis actor. Um, though, uh, as this tweet notes, of course, that in falsely accusing this pregnant woman of being a crisis actor, the Russian embassy just admitted that Russia did indeed bomb their trade plate. Um, they claimed that it had been occupied and if it's been occupied by military forces, it becomes a complex question according to the Geneva Conventions. You still can't bomb it uh, without any notice. Uh, but obviously, th does this look like a member of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion? Of course, the Russians keep talking about the Azov Battalion uh, because, yes, it has had some, certainly it's very right, possibly far right, possibly has some Nazi leanings. The Ukrainian military did bring it into its command structure. Um, it is in Mariupol, and it's probably gone. It's probably been completely destroyed. Um, but part of it is that's sort of one of the few threats the Russian authorities have had to actually point to these claims that they're denazifying Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to argue you're denazifying a country that has a Jewish president. Um, but they're, they're trying to make the claim. And unfortunately, 
unfortunately, one would hope that this be sort of international condemnation out of this hospital bombing would stop them. Um, and instead, what we saw is an acceleration of attacks against hospitals and healthcare facilities. Um, this was only the first of over 100 attacks that now occurred. That's from WHO data from the end of March, so the number is probably much higher than that. Um, and the problem is, these types of attacks, this is actually what Russia's been doing. They've been doing these same level of attacks in Syria, but they basically were able to get away with it. There wasn't very strong international competition there. And so they're using the same tactics that they used in Syria in Ukraine. And literally, it's the same command structure. It's the same officers coming in. A lot of the uh, high ups within the military command structure in the Russian forces in Ukraine have been serving in Syria, in Syria previously. A lot of them also has, have experience in Chechnya, which was another example where the Russians engaged in huge atrocities there, of course, against their own population. Um, and we also began seeing other allegations, including growing reports of Russia engaging in mass forced deportations from areas in Ukraine that they had occupied. And this comes back to your question about those 600,000 refugees. What's happening there? Well, and you can basically point to a, a few different things. Firstly, um, in the days before the actual invasion started, the uh, uh, government authorities within the LPR and the DPR, the two people's republics, um, said that their citizens had evacuated to Russia. Um, and at the time, I, I, along with others, argued that it looked like it was them attempting to do another pretext to justify an invasion. Um, but because that order had been given, you saw a lot of people actually move from the two autonomous republics into Russia. You then have seen other evidence that there's at least some people who have voluntarily gone into Russia simply because it's their only route out. And this has certainly affected people from Mariupol. Um, but in other cases, it's very clear that they're in effect being forced into doing it. And if they're being forced, then this actually does constitute a war crime of uh, forced deportation, where you're actually taking people from territory that you've occupied and you're forcibly moving them into your own territory. That is a bona fide war crime. Um, and you can see some of the evidence of this. Um, there were claims among, you know, particularly around Mariupol. Um, there is that much bigger number of 600,000. I don't think all those people were forcibly deported to Ukraine. Ukrainian authorities have claimed all of them were. Um, but I think that certainly some of these people were being forcibly deported. And this is the evidence that we see. This is uh, one of the reporters from the TV Independent, um, noting that basically these people are being moved, uh, they're being forced to move into Russia, they're being loaded onto buses, literally not being told where they're going. They're then taken to what are referred to as filtration camps, which, yeah, that never sounds good, um, where they're basically having their, uh, you know, if they've got devices on them, they're having their search histories checked, they're seeing if they support the government, they're seeing if they have family ties to Russia, all of these evidence, and then frequently these people are then being put onto uh, buses and then moved elsewhere. Um, they're being sent to some uh, regions that are really deep in Siberia, and in some cases it's like literally islands close to where they're being told, uh, congratulations, you now have a job for two years and you can't leave, which is forced deportation. Um, unfortunately, part of it is we've had a lot less information around this than around the other atrocities that are going on. Um, in early April, the Washington Post actually was able to interview someone who actually had been forced to do this from Marvel. Um, in her case, basically, um, she was forced to transport, and you can sort of see the, the, the diagrams here. Um, she was transported through to Rostov, um, and basically she went through one of these filtration camps, she was asked questions, and then what she claimed basically in Rostov was that she had family nearby and they let her leave. Um, and she left the convoy, which went on somewhere else, or, sorry, not from Rostov, but from uh, Tigral. Um, and then she was able to get a train herself uh, from Moscow, then to St. Petersburg, and then made it to Estonia, um, part of the issue, though, is we have very few of these first-hand um, witness accounts, and we don't know what's happened to people who are actually being transported or let to go. So, that's 600,000 people that we have no idea what's going on with them here. Um, and then, of course, when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we then saw the Russian retreat in the morning and the confirmation that they had been killing civilians within the um, including uh, most notably, of course, the town of 
Chicha as a suburb of uh, PV, where there's been at least 17 human bodies identified in mass graves. Um, the Russian authorities immediately claimed, oh, the Ukrainian soldiers have done the killing after they've evacuated, uh, based on no evidence. Um, and literally within 24 hours of that claim, uh, the New York Times just went, well, we've got satellite data, and we can actually, now that we know, literally there were bodies lying on the streets for weeks, and you can actually, you can't necessarily tell unless you're actually looking for it, but then you realize that that, that string of people are, are bodies. And in this case, they were literally going house to house. Uh, any male who was in the household, they just pulled out and shot and left the body on the street. Um, there have similarly been other mass graves that have been identified on Marvel using satellite images. So, you know, Ukraine authorities don't have control of the territory, but you can basically see large things that have been recently dug and reburied, uh, which is never a good sign. We've also seen reports documenting horrific cases of sexual violence, uh, basically rape camps, uh, torture, extrajudicial executions, and so on and so on. Uh, so the UN estimates that around 7,000 civilians have died, but they're basically saying, that, that, those are the ones that we can actually document. We have no idea how many civilians have actually died in conflict so far. So what's been going on internationally? What's been the response? And I mentioned a, a little bit already, we've seen, of course, massive arms sales. We've seen massive sanctions uh, leveled against Russia uh, by any number of states. But I wanted to talk a little bit about particularly the U.S. responses and then what the uh, international criminal court has done. Um, and obviously, it's a bit of an issue that Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Because, of course, the UN Security Council is designed to respond to things where a state invades another state. It's actually one of the core principles in the UN Charter. And so it gets a bit problematic when you have one state that can do this and then just veto any resolutions you want to pass. And that's, of course, what we saw happen. Um, very quickly, the UN Security Council moved uh, to pass a resolution which included condemnation of all the violations violations of the pieces of human rights. Uh, Russia vetoed it, um, but it was very notable that they were the only country to vote against it. Uh, but both China and India abstained on that resolution. There's also a process um, called, uh, what's called the Uniting for Peace procedure within the United Nations. And this was developed in the 1950s when, once again, the UN Security Council couldn't actually do anything because you then had the US and the Soviet Union vetoing everything. And so under the United for Peace resolution, it can get referred to the UN Security Council as a procedural matter, it can't be vetoed. And then the UN General Assembly can take it up in a special session. We saw that happen, and then we saw them vote on a resolution which condemned, uh, had even stronger condemnation language about the invasion. And there were 141 votes in favor, and only five against. Other resolutions have since been passed, including on the humanitarian situation, and also stripping Russia of its human rights counts to see. There was a push by Ukraine to actually see if it could be stripped from its UN Security Council seat, but that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Um, we've also seen other steps taken by the UN system, including the establishment of an independent international commission of inquiry. But the problem is here is, you know, the UN is hamstrung. There is the responsibility to protect doctrine, which argues that all states have a responsibility to protect their own populations from genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. And under the R2P, the UN Security Council can take action when a state is manifestly failing its responsibility. The problem is that structure works within the UN Security Council. And so as long as Russia can veto things, you similarly can't see action there. And that's why we've seen, sort of seen this two-track system, where we've seen these steps within the UN, but then we've also seen states doing independent sanctions and coordinated sanctions efforts. Um, so massive sanctions against the Russian financial system, taking them out of the SWIFT transaction system. Now, of course, the EU looking at potentially uh, banning all oil imports from Russia. That hasn't happened yet, but it might. Um, and, of course, things that have just basically destabilized any of the world apart from Russia. Um, like the amount of just financial losses your average Russian suffered under is immense. Um, and then there's the finally the question of what about international criminal justice? Um, because, well, guess what? Yeah. Russia's definitely done war crimes. They've definitely done crimes against humanity. There's been arguments made by the Ukrainian government.
government, but some other governments, including uh, MPs in Canada, picked up suggesting it's genocide. Uh, personally, I don't think it's crossed the genocide threshold yet. We haven't seen the deliberate targeting of Ukrainian people that we need to have for it to actually fall under a genocide definition. Um, nonetheless, war crimes and crimes against humanity are equally bad. And one of the interesting points here is that Ukraine isn't a full member of the ICC. Russia obviously has never signed the Rome Statute. But Ukraine did authorize the ICC to investigate situations following uh, 2014 and the establishment of the two autonomous people's republics. So what that means is the ICC can fully investigate all events occurring within Ukraine. It doesn't need authorization from the Security Council to do so, so Russia can't veto it because Ukraine agreed to it. And we already know that they're investigating. We know Ukrainian authorities are investigating. We know the EU is giving them aid to investigate. And basically, this is probably going to be one of the lasting legacies. Because if you were in Buka, if you were a Russian soldier in Buka, I'd be making it very clear right now on social media that you did not take part in any killings. Because chances are, your unit has already been identified. You probably already, already been identified by name and your registration number. And you will end up, whether it's in front of the ICC or whether it's under universal jurisdiction under a European state like Germany, you will eventually be tried and prosecuted for the acts that occurred there. You will eventually be tried and prosecuted for other acts that have been committed in conflict. This is like being a soldier in a concentration camp in World War II. It might take years, it might take decades, but you will eventually be prosecuted and you will probably end your life in jail somewhere. That's what a lot of the soldiers on the ground right now in this conflict need to understand. Same thing applies to Russian government officials. Putin himself, there's always a question around there's heads of state immunity in a lot of international law. So whether he himself could be prosecuted if it becomes questionable, there is a possibility. After all, Slobodan Milosevic died in a jail cell at the day for what he'd done in Bosnia. But the likelihood that we see Putin, I think, is a little low. The likelihood we see other senior Russian government officials eventually tried is high. The likelihood that these people are never able to travel internationally again ever travel to London, ever get on their yachts again, also high. So I'm hoping that this will be one of the lasting legacies of this conflict. Um, so I'll end there. Um, happy to take any questions now, or happy to also pop over to the pub, though I'm not sure how much